Releasing at IMAX later in December is a new documentary called Serengeti, Journey to the Heart of Africa in 3D. And it's my great pleasure to be speaking to the producer, writer and editor of Serengeti, Paul Field. And Paul, welcome again to Movie Metropolis. <laughs> Thank you for having me. It's great to see you, Peter. Good to talk to you again. And uh, this is such a, a fascinating documentary about uh, uh, part of Africa that uh, we don't often see. How did the uh, documentary come about? It's always been a bit of a passion project. I'm working with uh, another Australian, uh, Cam Batten, who's just an incredible cinematographer. And it was always on our sort of wish list because uh, there's a lot of natural history um products in the market, whether it's streaming services or um, uh, in other ways. And uh, we just thought the Serengeti was such a hopeful story. You know, it's it's something that we as a species has been doing right in protecting that area for a long time. And it's uh, it's it involves a number of different countries. And so uh, we just thought it was great to sort of go out and capture it. And when COVID happened, we just had this amazing opportunity uh, to get in there when there was no one else in there. So we just had the Serengeti to ourselves for a year, which, you know, uh, is it's unheard of, really. Uh, and so we had to do it. It, it wasn't even uh, could we do it? We just had to make it happen. So uh, and we did, luckily. Well, well done on that. Now, I know that uh, you actually didn't go to uh, to Africa itself for the filming, but tell me about the filming process, because I noticed there was some drone, there was some drone photography and, and other, um, you know, great shots that were, were made. Uh, I can imagine that uh, a lot of that had to be planned very carefully. Yeah, and you have to you have to plan it on a number of uh, of different aspects. One is just wear and tear, bringing the right equipment in there into an environment, uh, you know, where uh, nothing goes to plan. So you you don't know if you're going to get caught in a storm. You know, we had big electrical storms where we were there. You're lugging equipment huge areas uh, because you don't know where the animals are going to be. Uh, one day you've got a herd of wildebeest, a million strong, and then you wake up the next morning. And they've just gone. And so uh, nature dictates where you're shooting. So you have to be very mobile. You have to pack as light as you can. But for IMAX and uh, 3D, uh, it does require a lot of gear and handling. Um, and that's why, you know, Cam Batten was just the best person for the job, because that's what he does, whether it's Antarctica or whether it's at the top of Everest or whether it's with huge lions, uh, you know, beside his tent. He's just the perfect person for the job, really. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, he certainly had, uh, has done a great job in the in the directing process. And it's interesting how the IMAX camera has evolved over time. It's become smaller, uh, more mobile. Uh, it's certainly digital, uh, much more digital capacity now, etc. So I can imagine it would be easier to set up deep focus shots, etc. with using the IMAX camera. Definitely. Uh, back in the day, you know, when you had people like John Wiley, who made Antarctica, you know, 30 years ago, he was lugging huge uh, cameras that were weighing half a ton each. He had to have two of them for parallax for 3D shooting. Uh, yeah, we're we're really lucky. Uh, the new generation, uh, we can put drones up and get shots that you would have needed a helicopter to get. Uh, we can do quite a bit of stuff in in post, so you can bring stuff back in digital and uh, mess around with it until you get it to lock. Uh, how you want it so it doesn't have to look uh, like it did but having said that the demands for cinematographers now um, of the the level and quality that they bring to market is much bigger um, so back in the day you could sit out with uh, you know a Canon D4 digital camera on sticks and sit and just wait um, and uh, now you have to get very close to the animals. People want to be right up there. They want intimate, intimate portraits. You can't do that on the long lens. You, ha you have to have a certain amount of bravado, but also respect for the animals. We're very, very conscious that we don't want to interfere with the natural 
uh, working of those systems. So uh, there isn't, we don't have a shot in, in our archive or on our hard drives of animals being spooked. Uh, we don't interfere. We, you, you won't see the, the, yeah, you just won't see unnatural behavior because we haven't affected it. And so that requires sitting inland patient for a long time until the animals get to know you uh, and you become part of their environment and they know that you're not going to chase them or hunt them or, uh, or are there for nefarious reasons. Uh, and so that just takes time. And so you can't, you can't shortcut that. It doesn't matter how good your technology is. There's a certain skill to capturing nature and it's, it's respecting nature's timeline, I think. Oh, look, absolutely. You can you can see that that the, that the animals were calm and comfortable and and all all those wildebeest, <laughs> the uh, millions of them, etc. They seemed uh, quite happy, etc. Um, uh, so, uh, as you said, it took a long time to do this filming, although um, because of COVID, you had uh, opportunities to film over a long time. Were you seeing rushes, so to speak, or digital uh, uh, bits of what had been filmed uh, along the process to see oh, how absolutely. the story would fit together? Yeah, that's the joy. Um, that's the joy of the age we live in now. Um, um, uh, the way our studios, the way definition studios are, are linked up, uh, we're pulling down rushes about a gig a second, uh, which means, um, yeah, we, we can we can see it in real time if we want to. It all depends on the connection speed uh, in Kenya or in Tanzania, which wasn't always so great. Uh, but no, the, the modern age now is, uh, it's remarkable. We were, myself and Cam were working on another shoot in China for another project recently, and we were directing in real time. So we had Chinese cinematographers and crew. We had uh, an interpreter, uh, so they didn't speak English. Uh, we were able to align the shot like marionettes uh, in real time. And that's just amazing. Uh, to be able to do that. So I do think we're in a sort of golden age of documentary filmmaking where people can get in and start making movies relatively low budget. You know, you don't need the funding of the BBC or a major corporation or a streaming network to actually just go out and start shooting stuff and putting it together in your in, in your own house. I mean, it is it, it is great. And hopefully that means we're going to see better stories from new um, filmmakers, uh, younger generation coming into the market and just changing things up. I'm quite excited to see see that happen already. So um, yeah, I, th I think we're in a golden age really uh, with this new tech. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I can see that. And of course, IMAX in itself, having so many theatres around the world, there's a ready-made market for documentaries like this. Oh, absolutely. Uh, the thing, one of the things I really like about IMAX is it's very unforgiving of mistakes. So if you shoot something, you put it on a TV screen, you can kind of get away with some errors. The shot doesn't have to be per perfect. There can be some movement. Uh, if you project that image up onto a cinema screen that is, you know, roughly 12 times bigger than the average cinema screen, uh, any flaws whether it's focus or mobility or just dirty frames, lenses, or, uh, will be revealed. And so the big canvas is wonderful for that. Um, and that's what, what makes it so immersive. When you sit in a room and you're surrounded by an image that big, if the cinematographer has done their job right, you should feel like you're there. Uh, and uh, that's, that's the benefit of it. And that's the challenge of it, I think. Uh, it's just very unforgiving, uh, yeah. <laughs> but very rewarding. Yeah, absolutely understand that because you need to have such a steady image and and uh, and make it clean and clear, etc. So for you also as editor, uh, I mean, as you said, you were receiving footage as 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 it was as you were going along, but the editing process to get down to that 40 minutes approximately for the IMAX um, screen that must have been quite a challenge. Um, 
Well, luckily it's kind of chronological because what we're doing is we're spending a year in the Serengeti. So we know there's big moments we want to catch. We know we want to catch the wildebeest crossing the Mara. We want to, we know we want to see a newborn lion cub. Uh, we know we want to, so there's certain things uh, we want to see, but uh, uh, yeah, there was a lot of footage and um, because we're being respectful of the animal, uh, there's a lot of footage of us, of animals, bots, really, because you're sort of, they turn their back to you a lot. Uh, and then you just have to wait a long time before you get those beautiful animal faces uh, turning around, being comfortable, and then just sitting. And then you're in the right spot. So, um, yeah. Uh, so that we knew there were certain things we wanted to get. We wanted to get a fire scene. We wanted to get... Uh, the lightning storms we wanted to get the you know giraffes in the woods there was there were certain things uh, we had earmarked um and that but we were trying to tell a different story most most natural history stories in that area have focused either on the big five so the you know the animals that people go to see when they pay thirty thousand dollars to go on a safari or they want to see the predator and prey story which we've seen a lot and so we kind of wanted to tell a story that was just a wasn't a bad climate change or conservation. We didn't want it to be a big message. We weren't trying to save the world. We, we just wanted people to see the beauty of it. But we also wanted to sort of portray it as an ecosystem, as, you know, the dung beetle is connected to the wildebeest. The wildebeest uh, are connected to the cats. The elephants, uh, you know, are connected to the giraffes, the the hippos are connected to the elephants. They wouldn't survive without elephants making water holes. Um, and so that was the idea really, was just to capture a moment in time and then share that with people. Okay, yeah, and you certainly have done that. Um, tell me about who the narrator was. I didn't recognize who it was and the music that you used. So uh, we did experiment with different narrators on that. Uh, the temptation is always to go for a big name, which we've done in the past, uh, whether it's Sam Neill or Russell Crowe. Uh, uh, this one was uh, an American uh, who, um, he just tested well with audiences. He wasn't actually going to be the final voice, but in the end, um, uh, um, people seem to to like him so he is a he's a kind of no name uh actor at the moment but hopefully that will change um uh but i think it, it worked well i mean we did experiment to be frankly honest we did experiment with uh, more traditional african voices uh and uh that sort of tested well in australia and it tested well in some areas and it then it didn't test well in other areas and so uh, you kind of just have to respect the audience uh, for uh, the voice that they're comfortable with. Um, personally, I prefer to use female voices, um, but I, um, you know, there's always a sort of difference of opinion uh, on these things. Uh, so, um, but I quite like, um, we used Rose Byrne recently on a project for Netflix and she was amazing, uh, like absolutely amazing. So, uh, yeah, it's just the voice that hits, you know, at, who's ever available at the right time and, and what people think hits the story right. And, uh, yeah. Okay. And the music? The music is Mark Williams. Now, I love Mark Williams. Uh, he is an American uh, composer. Uh, he, uh, so he scored that. He's done work with um, uh, Ron Howard and various other sort of big name directors. We were very lucky that there was a window in COVID uh, and that he is a fan of uh, natural history. Uh, and so we were really lucky. Um, we were really lucky to get him. I think you uh, you were at a screening and I think you might have heard the temp mix. Uh, so uh, that won't be the mix that actually goes out and plays to the general public. Mm -hmm. if, if there's another stage of refinement on that uh, so I think you might have heard of where the music was probably a bit loud uh, and in places uh, uh, but uh, yeah Mark Williams he, he is he's, he's remarkable uh, what he can do okay um, 
it still sounded fine. So it, I didn't have a problem with that. <laughs> um, I, I've spoken to a few other um, IMAX filmmakers and sometimes they release a longer version of the film, of the documentary for, um, uh, for screening at non-IMAX theatres. Is there that prospect for Serengeti? Absolutely. Uh, so um, we were just very keen to get this to market and to hit the American market as cinemas were reopening. Uh, there will be a longer version, which hopefully will play to Australian audiences at some stage, uh, which, um, yeah, which I'm really looking forward to. And then there's a shorter cut, uh, uh, which also will be playing. And that might even uh, be rescripted and go out to school groups and so forth. It will also play in domes. So it's cut specifically to play, to be even more immersive. So to play in the big domes in, uh, you know, like in Alabama and places like that around the world where uh, you just have these giant screens that go all the way behind your ears, which are amazing. Yeah. I find that so interesting that uh, the one film can be uh, cut and and uh, available in different ways for different audiences uh, for different types of uh, screening venues. I think that's uh, that's terrific because documentary, I think, is such an important uh, part of the film uh, process for audiences. Absolutely. And, and we have to do a separate cut then if it's playing on a streaming service. So if it then goes on to one of the big streaming services or their streaming services are just dedicated to documentaries, uh, you kind of have to take away uh, uh, the wide, a lot of the wide shots, because in IMAX, uh, the thing is, you want to let people do their own editing. So sometimes the shots are 20, 25 seconds long. Uh, and people look around in the screen and you just trust that people will do that. They'll, they'll, you know, look left and right and up. They'll follow a, a vulture soaring into the sky or they'll pick a, a animal in a herd and be looking that at that one crosses the river. You don't get that uh, on TV, even big, huge TVs that are right around Australia. Everyone's getting bigger and bigger TVs. Uh, but even then, even if you have a 60 inch screen TV in your house, uh, you have to cut it differently. So you have to take away a lot of those wides and you have to shorten the length of the shots. So a 20 second shot might go down to, you know, six or five. And then, so you're kind of doubling your edits. Uh, so from an editor's point of view, that's also really interesting is getting to know the format. And um, some editors are just uncomfortable with IMAX because they, I, I guess they just don't trust the audience. Uh, they like to direct the audience with how they cut. Uh, and you have to be trusting of the audience that they're going to, you know, uh, the, that they're going to enjoy it. It's kind of like, Peter, it's kind of like how slow can you ride a bike uh, uh, with IMAX? Uh, so you have to slow it down as much as you can without the story falling over. Uh, and uh, that's the challenge, I think. Um, but the rewards, again, are huge. Uh, if you get it right. Okay, very interesting to hear that. I like that uh, sort of technical process. And the, and the other issue, of course, is 3D versus 2D and yes. whether that uh, needs to be filmed separately or whether that can, can be incorporated uh, quite easily. So uh, shooting 3D in camera is called native. So uh, you have, we do a lot of native shooting. The elephants, uh, a lot of the animal portraits. So when you see a big cat sitting on a rock or you see an elephant walking gently towards the screen that was shot in camera. So that was captured in 3D. And then if you've got a drone, uh, we can we do have the capacity to shoot uh, 3D drone, but it often causes problems. So you then do it in post. So uh, you're splitting the image and you're creating your own sort of parallax. So you're creating you're splitting the image left and right. And then you can adjust how far back the 3D looks or how close it is to the audience. Um, uh, and then every director or editor or production crew has a preference. Some uh, really like the 3D to pop in over the audience, sort of like that Jaws moment where the shark comes out and over. Um, and certainly younger kids love that. And then the older you get, people kind of like the depth of field. They like the image to be pushed back. So they they so the auditorium or the cinema just becomes really large. 
it, it, it's like the screen, the IMAX screen gets just pushed back an extra couple of hundred feet. Uh, and I quite like that. It's quite subtle. Um, and um, I think just on a subliminal or psychological level, it's it's rewarding again. Uh, you just feel that you're out in these vast planes. Um, whereas if it's popping out, it's kind of gimmicky a little bit. Uh, and once it happens a couple of times in a movie, well, that's it's like a pop-up book. You know, it's 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 limited. Um, so I prefer pushing the image back, but everyone's different. <laughs> Again, so interesting to hear that. Yeah. You've been in, in, involved, uh, Paul, in a number of films, and you reminded me that we spoke about Turtle Odyssey, and and you've you've made so many others. How do you decide what uh, you make? Um, I nearly always in the last sort of five or six years, I fo I I focus on species or environments that I think need focus. So. Uh, I've done some on, I did one on the Australian sea line. Uh, that movie actually changed the rating, the threat level of that animal. Uh, so that really helped with the publicity and it helped with the marine rangers in South Australia get attention for uh, an Australian mammal that was on the brink. Uh, so, uh, but, so I, I like to pick, yeah. Um, we're doing one now on butterflies, uh, which is beautiful. That's going to be a beautiful family movie. But uh, they're uh, they're the pollinators, just like bees, uh, and they're in danger too. So uh, I like to pick um, I like to pick movies that are warranted, uh, but are entertaining. And so even though these are conservation movies, there's no heavy conservation message in there i would rather just remind people of how beautiful nature is uh and that we have to look after it but there's no preaching there's no uh you know the world's going to end the sky is falling uh, climate change i i just don't think scaring people into action is the right way to go i'd rather inspire people with awe and wonder i'd rather just remind them that we just have this uh, remarkable planet uh, and it's incredibly intertwined. We're a part of it and we're a, a kind of a steward part of it. We have a really important role to play in conservation and that it's possible. So that's kind of what attracts me to these projects, giving a voice to animals that don't have a voice. And I think that's really important uh, that you advocate for something. Um, rather than just yourself and so for me it's animals uh, for other people it's social justice or it's you know whatever it is uh, but um you know like you're an advocate for good cinema and for you know and i think that's really important so whatever it is that you're sort of spreading your passion uh, to other people uh, and uh you know, I think that's great. And again, that's just we're in a golden age of that. You know, we can we're in different cities and we can have a conversation. And and uh, these are the things that if we use this technology wisely, it's brilliant uh, rather than just distracting. Uh, so, yeah, I like projects that are entertaining and informative. Yeah. Absolutely. I fully endorse that. And interesting you mentioned about uh, the butterflies. Um, um... Uh, documentary that you're working on and I notice you're working on others at the moment as well that are coming up so uh, you're uh, it's good to be busy with uh, so oh, yeah. many projects <laughs> yeah 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 no I'm not complaining it's it's great uh, so uh, it's yeah it's just and thank to you know people like IMAX Melbourne are very helpful in 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 that in actually giving us an Australian screen there's going to be another screen up in Sydney soon that was offline for a while because they were rebuilding. Mm. Uh, you know, China is planning to build 300 IMAX screens over the next couple of years. Um, and that's the other thing I like. I like uh, not only advocating for animals, but also uh, Australia is just such an amazing country uh, on so many different levels. Uh, and I came here in 95 and I've still only scratched a tiny part of it. Uh, you know, so I get out there as much as I can, whether uh, it's to Magnetic Island or whether it's, you know, out into the uh, Mudawinji Ranges or wherever it is. Uh, but you could spend a whole lifetime wandering around, having a look at things. Uh, and the the life here is so unique. The 80 percent of the animals are endemic here. They don't exist anywhere else. Uh, 
we don't have the great apes. We, do, we didn't have a hoofed animal. We've got these amazing monotremes and marsupials. So we've got this amazing uh, array of life that sort of evolved on its own for 60 million years. Uh, and I think that's a big part of uh, the message um, is that uh, we, we should treasure that, that we are the guardians of this amazing continent uh, and it's worth protecting, whether it's the Great Barrier Reef, which is where my journey started in natural history um, uh, years and years ago. And, you know, realizing that that could go, that that, well, it will certainly change, you know, and so... Yeah. And the, the more I get into Australia, the more I travel around, uh, the more amazed I am by it. Um, so, yeah. Look forward to it's all those uh, upcoming documentaries about Australia. Yes. <laughs> right. uh, yeah. uh, animals and, and etc. It sounds fantastic. Paul, it's been such a pleasure talking to you. We've been speaking to Paul Phelan, who is the editor, producer and writer of Serengeti Journey to the Heart of Africa uh, in 3D, screening at IMAX later this month in December. Uh, and uh, Paul, thank you so much for talking with me. Thank you. Lovely chatting to you too. All the best. Bye-bye. Um.